Welcome to Move Church. Thanks for joining us for this week's message. We pray this message will both move and inspire you to make a decision into an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. This relationship is where you obtain freedom and will help value your purpose and give you the power to engage your world. Now to the message. All right, what's going on, church? How we doing this morning? Come on, can y'all get big for Jesus one more time in this place? Come on, can we make some noise? Hallelujah. I am excited to be here this morning. It is an honor to stand before you. I have the privilege to give you the word, and I don't take that lightly. This is a morning that we are going to sing the praises of the Lord through worship or through our heart being in the right place. So I hope you're excited. I hope you're locked in. I hope you're with me. I'm going to take you on a series for a couple of weeks that I think is going to bless your life. The last time I was here, we talked about something that I thought would hurt you. And I just get this theme over my life. I feel like God always speaks to me and says, yo, Dre, you're the guy I need to talk about with difficult things too. And I want you to share those difficult things with the people in your life. And so here he has me in this awkward position again between you and I standing here having conversations that you know we try to hide and keep in the dark. So we're going to have another conversation this morning. We're going to have another discussion that's biblically based, but it's a worldly issue. Amen. It's a worldly issue. But before I go into that, I got to be real with y'all. Yesterday was wild and crazy. Like, it was hot, y'all. Anybody was hot yesterday? That's why I got this fly shirt on this morning, man. I had to wear some some air vents through it. (laughs) But listen up. So I took this group of people right here. Y'all might not be able to see them very well. There's like, there's 15 of them, I think, right there. There's April Thomas. There's my man. Who is that? That's Taylor Siracho, and that's Carlos Siracho. That's Mark Zimmerman. That's Brandy Winston. That's Josh Roscoe. That's Johnny Contreras. That is Kathia Contreras. That's Stephanie Contreras. That is Ashley Finley. That's Jonathan Juicy. That's Jenny Juicy. That's my beautiful wife over there to the right. And then there's Heather and your boys in the middle. We went to Kings Dominion, y'all, with 55 high school students and middle schoolers. And we made some noise in that park. But, yo, listen, there was all types of obstacles. There was two hours of traffic. Oh, man, it was like 100 degrees. And your boy woke up this morning like, yo, I ain't the guy I used to be. I ain't the dude I used to be. I could walk stuff off like that. This morning I was like, baby, oh, oh, I don't know if I'm that dude anymore. I don't know if I'm that dude anymore. But can we make some noise for this team right here, guys? They truly, they truly are a blessing. They chased after these young people literally yesterday all throughout the park, but they chased after them for the sake of relationship and the hopes that they would know Jesus. We had several kids who had never gone to church before here, and so it was such an honor and a cool thing to see them in a place like that having fun with a bunch of people who believe in God. And so as a result of that, what happens is they start to come to church just because they had a fun experience within the world around people who reflect the kingdom of God. And so that's why I encourage you to find young people, to encourage them to get into their lives, to get them into positions so that they can see who Jesus is rightly. And so our Young Life ministry is devoted to doing that. And I am just so grateful to be blessed with a team such as this. So can y'all make noise for them one more time? Yeah. Yeah. Um, now it's time to get into the conversation. Y'all ready? Y'all ready? It's not so crazy for me to say that a lot of you are living in your own nostalgia. You're looking at your past life, all the things that you used to do, and you're checking out, thinking that your future's set. Man, I used to do all these... Yo, I was a pastor back in the day. I led youth group. I used to invest in the young people. I used to put my effort out there, but this is my time to just chill, to kick back. I'm living in my nostalgia. I have a reputation. I've done things in my life. There's no reason for me to have the same interest or energy as I move forward. I can just coast in this position because I've put the work in to be where I'm at today. Some of you 
might look at young people and say, now nah, that's why that generation is so lost. Or I don't have any interest in investing in them. And they're, like, they're gone. There's nothing I can do for them. It wasn't like that in my day. Your day's not here anymore. It's time for a new generation to rise up. Maybe that attitude needs to change. And how can I go chase after somebody and invest in them something that I want and that I have in my life? Amen. Like, how am I going to change the course of this world if I have a mentality that says I'm just going to stay where I'm at? Right now. And many of you are staying where you are because of one word that we are going to crush in the next couple of weeks. You're comfortable. You're comfortable. And what I realized a couple of weeks ago, maybe, sounds crazy for a guy that's been given the word for so long, is that comfort is the enemy of the gospel. Yes. Comfort is the enemy of the gospel. Look at the luxury and the lavishness that we have in our day-to-day -day lives. There are all sorts of devices and things that we can attach to ourselves to make everything around us convenient. Like every single thing that we need can be just a few footsteps or maybe within a hand's reach away. And if it's not, I ain't extending my hand. I'm not using any energy. I'm comfortable where I'm at. Your comfort is going to kill your relationship with Jesus. Show me anyone in the Bible who was a follower and a believer who lived a comfortable life. And if you feel a little hot this morning, maybe because the Lord is speaking to you. Right I don't want to offend you, but the word of God should leave you different than the way that you walked in. Amen. Because if you came in here this morning just thinking that this was going to be a typical Sunday with a typical word, and I'm going to have a typical response, you are wrong. Every time you walk into God's house, you should prepare for your entire mind to be blown. Amen. You should be so locked in, so ready because of the six days that you worked and grinded that you need this, this word to restore you and to fill you back up, to empower you to walk out of this door and to be different than the way that you came in. Amen. You should never have a response that says, done that, been there when it comes to the gospel. Every single word renews itself over and over again. Every time you read it, at every stage in your life, there's a different way to interpret the gospel. That's why it's called the living word. Hallelujah. The living word. Hallelujah. But you're so comfortable that the living word is no longer living. Right, it stopped and it died. And you left those good deeds because you were hurt in that previous relationship. Baby, I got news for you. Just because he did that to you doesn't mean that that's God's promise for you. Amen. And so many of you are living lives based on past experiences that hurt you. And guess what? It puts you in a position to be locked into comfort. Right now. Because I'm going to protect my heart from being hurt. Because I'm not going to do anything that challenges me that I know that might possibly put me in a potential situation to hurt me. But there is no one in the gospel, not one, who lived a life of pure comfort. Even Job, the guy who received riches from God. Check this out. God said himself to the devil, yo, check my boy out. Go mess with him for a little while. I'll offer him to you. Do you understand that type of a challenge that a good sovereign God would put a man who had his favor in a position to be toiled with? And do you think that you're not going to be in a similar situation within your life to be toiled with? But because you go through hard times and because you're hurt from previous situations, you don't think that you need to put yourself out there anymore. Mama. So you stay safe. So you stay safe in every situation. It's interesting to me how for many years, decades probably, people worked sitting down. And now everybody has a bracelet on. I got to get my steps in. I got to get to moving. Got to get my 10,000 steps in. Because they figured out that sitting stationary for a long period of time is not good for your health. 
So I wonder, maybe if I'm stationary in my Christianity, I know we're in church, I shouldn't say that. Maybe if I'm just complacent with the way I deal with God, I'm not going to say that because I don't want to offend y'all. Maybe if I just say my prayers at the beginning of the day and the end of the day because, hey, that's how mom raised me. But maybe if I just put God in this box, he's going to give me all of these blessings. But I got news for you. In Revelations, it tells you this. If you are not hot or cold, I'm going to spit you out. You got to be one or the other. You got to be one or the other. And in fact, God says, I'd hate to have you in a situation where you're in between. I'd rather you be cold, straight, wilding out, doing everything that you want, living your best life in the world than sitting up here playing games with being back and forth about how you feel about me. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be married to someone who ain't all in. Jesus is the same way. Isn't it crazy to think that the natural process in which our Father created is very similar to the way that we live our lives? You can see a lot of God in your day-to-day interactions with human beings. I wonder why that is. That's because he created you. And when something creates you, it knows everything about you. It knows everything that you need. And so he knows that you need a relationship with him that requires you stepping out of your comfort zone all the time. Amen. You got to get off the boat. You're still sitting in the boat wondering whether or not that's a real miracle. God still does miracles. The reason they don't happen in your life is because you don't believe in them. I'm not going to give you a miracle if you don't trust me. That's why he says I'm looking for faith more than anything else. You don't believe no more because you've been hurt. And I don't blame you. You've been hurt so much that you can't even walk out this door and confess that Jesus is your Savior. But if this ceiling opened up. And if he can to return in this moment, where would you stand? Because at that point, the Bible says it's too late to make a decision. I already made a decision on you before I opened up the heavens and came down to see you. I wanted to know a long time ago, Dre, were you going to trust me? I wanted to know a long time ago, were you going to invest in me? Are you going to wait until you're on your deathbed to start to come and confess who you are to me? That's not the best time to do it. I'll accept you, but I want your life at the early stages so I can use it for the advancement of the kingdom. And so many people are living worldly lives because they were never introduced to the kingdom first. And that's why I tell parents it's inherently important for you to have kids with a mindset of purpose and not recreation. Because when I have intentionality and I have purpose when I have children, guess what? I have preparation for them. When my wife and I sit down to talk about, baby, we want to have kids, that means we are preparing to bring life into the world, which means I'm going to have to give up my life so that they can have life. I'm going to have to sacrifice. I'm going to be uncomfortable. But when they come by accident, I treat them like they're an accident. And that's the way that some of you are treating the relationship between you and God. You ain't really here for me, God. I ain't seen you enough. You ain't giving me the car I wanted. You ain't give me the job. I was like, bro, I want that promotion last week. It's a wrap. I'm done with you. Man, I sent a letter to her. I apologize, but they ain't respond. That's one of my favorite ones. You don't stop trusting God because you didn't get the answer in that moment. Who do you think you are? Trust him some more. You know who he is? He's sovereign. Do you recognize who you're standing in the presence of? Like, don't just turn around and think just because it didn't work out in that moment, you're going to quit. Your life is but a speck on this carpet in comparison to a tire room of his kingdom. There have been men and women before you. There will be men and women after you. Will you be comfortable? So today's message is titled, Let's Get Comfortable. (laughs) Let's get comfortable. Let's get comfortable. I mean, I hope I've encouraged you enough to be comfortable. I don't want you to doubt whether or not you should be comfortable. I don't want to convict you either. If you just have some Saturdays, we're just going to be comfortable. But I want you to see the similarities between a life of comfort living for God in comparison to a life of expectation when you are trusting in God. And so today, we're going to go to the book of Hebrews. I like to always provide you with some type of biblical context that gives you reference of where this book comes from. And the books of the Bible were broken down to give people order because when they were written on scrolls, it was hard to determine where things took place. 
And so the book of Hebrews is very important to the Old Testament, even though it's in the New Testament, because it carries a lot of the same ideology. So if you're wondering what the book of Hebrews is for, it's really, they think it's Paul mostly writing it. They haven't been able to just exactly prove that, but most people think Paul. Paul Paul writes almost everything, so people are like, hey, you know what, Paul, you probably wrote this too. But it hasn't been confirmed. But supposedly he was the author of this letter that was sent to people like you. So today, I'm going to send you the letter. The same way that he did in the book of Hebrews. Here's this letter. And what you'll find out in the Bible, there are a lot of letters written to the church for you. You're the church. It didn't stop. The letters are still here today. In fact, I'm wondering if there's a Paul in this audience. Because it ain't stopped yet. I saw one hand go up over there. I'm like, I'm following you. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. And he Pauls, I'm running after you. I wonder if there's a Paul in this audience. Because God says, I came to do greater deeds. But I'm telling you, the belief level in today's world is so low because of the news and the things that you see. You don't even trust and believe in miracles anymore because you haven't been witness to them. You haven't witnessed them because you haven't confessed your faith enough. When's the last time you told that coworker who you can't stand, you know what, I don't like you, but Jesus does. And because he does, and because he does, I'm going to treat you the way that he treated me. I'm going to treat you the way he treated me. I can't stand you, but God stands me. I know I ain't great. I don't deserve it. But you know what? I'm going to give it to you anyways. Because I want to to be an agent that reflects the authority of the badge I wear on my heart. And y'all are wearing badges when you walk into work, and you're confessing and lining yourself up with all these institutions, and they ain't got nothing on the kingdom of heaven. You've given yourself to a job because they've given you a paycheck, but he wants to give you an eternity, and you won't trust him. The problem is sometimes you attach your faith to what you can see. And I'm telling you, if you do that, then stop praying because when you're praying, you're asking for something you can't see to come to where you can see it. And if you're not going to trust it in that situation, why waste your energy and effort? Because God doesn't work that way. When you pray, you are sending legislation to heaven to be voted on for its approval to come into your life. And you don't understand the power and the majesty of who you stand in the presence of when you send your prayers up. There is not one prayer that does not get to the seat of God to, uh, to approve and to determine the worthiness of this prayer. He hears you in every single situation. Amen. But you equate hearing to a response in your time. But God's calendar is different than your calendar. Yes. I have prayed for things when I was a child and they became actual when I was an adult. Yes. I've told you guys before, my mom was on her knees when I was a little boy. Son, I want to see you stand for the glory of God. I said, Mom, that'll never happen. Where am I standing today? Where am I standing today? You got to start believing that the timing on your prayers is not based on yours, but it's on God's. So let's go to the book of Hebrews. There's 19 verses. It's going to be lengthy. You got it in front of you, but I want to walk you through it. I want to walk you through it. It says this, therefore... Holy brothers and sisters, he's talking to you, who share in heavenly calling. How about that? Have you ever thought of yourself as having a heavenly calling? Every single person in here has a heavenly calling. Think about that for a second. Now the person who you thought didn't put no time into doing their hair right, realize, you know what? Even though their hair don't look to your standards, they still have a heavenly calling. I was in line yesterday with people. I'm listening to their conversation. I'm like, my Lord, Jesus, bless it. Throw your blood on it. That's just all types of filth. But they still have a heavenly calling. They just don't know about it. He says, goes on to say this. Consider Jesus, the apostle and the high priest of our confession. He was faithful to the one who appointed him. God, his father. Just as Moses was in all God's household. This is good. For Jesus is considered worthy of more glory than Moses. Why? Because he's a son to the heir. He's a son. Moses was a servant, good, faithful servant, but a son has more authority than a servant. You're a son and a daughter, and you have authority to seek heavenly power to come into your life, but you're not operating with that because you're comfortable. And because you're comfortable, you're not going to receive a blessing that's going to change the circumstances of your life. And your life does not change with a Ferrari. It changes with a mindset that's healthy. 
I've seen life gone too early because the mind wasn't healthy. So no matter what the person dreamed, it would never come into actuality because the mind wasn't healthy. That's a word for somebody this morning. You need to know that your mind is more important than the physical things that you occupy because they turn to dust. So stop worrying about the angles that you take your picture in and start worrying about the angles that you attack the hearts of those around you. For Jesus is considered worthy of more glory than Moses, just as the builder has more honor than the house. I know you bought it, but somebody built it. And I've learned to respect the person who builds it more than the person who bought it. Because if you built it once, they can build it again. I say, if you built it once, you can do it again. And although I occupy the house, I need someone to come and show me how to build a house. How about that? I want to be connected to the one who built the house because there will forever be prosperity if you built the house. Not every house is built by someone, but the one who built everything is God. Man, they was dropping gems back. I don't care what y'all say about y'all's memes on Instagram and Facebook. Nobody got them like the Bible, y'all. You just got to take a little bit of time to read into it. They dropped gems even today. Moses was faithful as a servant, as I told you a minute ago. He was faithful as a servant in all God's household as a testimony to what would be said in the future. But Christ was faithful as a son over our household. And we are that household if we hold on to our confidence and the hope in which we boast. I'm going to read that again because y'all looking at me kind of crazy right now. And we are that household. If we hold to our confidence and hope in which we boast. I'm going to continue. And this is where it gets really good. It's my favorite part because I had to set you up to understand the power that you stand on. What you have access to first. Know the, you got to know the ordinance of things. When I know where I fit in the family, I fit better in that family. That's why when I talk to my son or my daughter, I give them the names of who they are. Son, you have gifts. You have talents. You have a purpose. You're here on purpose. There's intentionality that I want you to live your life with. Baby, I love you. You have standards. You're beautiful. But more important than your beauty is your inward beauty. I've got to define them early by the way God defines me so that they can see who a good father is through their earthly father. You come to know things sometimes by the way that people treat you. Unfortunately, we haven't all been treated well, but that is a sin against that individual. But the dominion and the power of the kingdom of God is still heavenly. And so you have to connect to it to know how to communicate to people around you. Amen. It goes on to say this. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in rebellion. On the day of testing in the wilderness, he's speaking to the people, this is a reference to the people of Israel because you know what happened to them. They had a calling over their life and they did what? I'm going to ignore it. I'm going to get comfortable. I'm going to do my thing. How many of y'all have heard from God, but you ignored it? Like you heard from God, but you're like, I hear you, God, but I, I kind of trust this a little more. Let me go ahead and do this for myself because even though you made me, I still know what's best for myself. It goes on to say this. When your ancestors tested me, tried me, and saw my works for 40 years, therefore I was provoked to anger. This is God speaking, or Jesus. With that generation, and I said, they will always go astray in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. And so I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest. This is good. You need to know what rest is, and I found that out recently. Rest isn't being at the beach with a Coca-Cola and Turks and Caicos. I know it seems like it is, y'all. Like, you know, them six-day weeks, they be grinding. It's tough. I know it seems like I'll be at the beach, I'll be rested. But you ever come back from a vacation need another one? I find myself, as I'm getting older, need another vacation right after the vacation. The rest is not in the vacation. It's in the Word of God. You miss that. I am restored when I read the truth about what God says I'm supposed to do. My heart is lightened. There's no burden on me anymore because now I know that what I do in the world is not just something I'm doing, but it's for the glory of God. So it rests my soul. I'm no longer weary in my mind because I've read the word. It has affirmed in me the acts that I am supposed to be able to live out. If I'm at the beach, that's a temporary moment. 
it's going to stop or end. And even if it does not, it does not provide with me with fulfillment. You can only take so many pictures of a beach. You can only swim in it for so long. It's not going to fulfill you. Only a relationship with God will provide you with total fulfillment. Amen. Hallelujah. It goes on to say this. Watch out, brothers and sisters. Talking to y'all again. You ain't talking to me because, you know, your boy got it together, y'all. <laughs> talking to me first. So that there won't be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Mama. Watch out, brothers and sisters, so that there won't be in any, in any of you an evil and an unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Yes. Sometimes comfort can be tricky. Yes. Sometimes comfort can put you in such a position of serene that you don't have a clear view of reality. You're so comfortable that you've forgotten what the mission was. And then what happens is you get relaxed and sin starts to find its way in. Man, the devil's clever. He'll find you in your weakest point. He'll give you all the luxury and you'll be thinking to yourself, because I have luxury and things are easy, I must be blessed. I'm here to confess just because you have received things in this world does not mean you are going to heaven. So I don't want you to think that you can judge your sanctification based on the paycheck that you get or the things that you've obtained in life. Not right now. Because I've seen men in high places and I've seen women in high places and I've seen men in low places and I've seen women in low places and my, I've seen a difference in the spirit, yes. in the way in which they conduct themselves yes. based on a relationship with God. That's why you can go to Africa or any place where it's desolate and there's not much resources and they can worship harder than you do on a Sunday with lights. Yes with words on the screen, yeah. their voices collectively can make a better resounding voice than ours can with production. Why? Because God didn't need that. He just needed you. Amen. And if you're locked into it and you're not being comfortable, you will make a sound to him that will get the angels to stand up and to begin to send blessings to you because you are being faithful to what he's called you to do and not responding to any type of screen or any type of production. You are responding to God who's in your heart. I've never seen worship like when I was in Africa with my wife. Voices lifted up because you know why? They didn't have anything else. It was all him. Hallelujah. And the difference with you is you got all types of other things to make you comfortable and to forget about God for six days and come back in here and act like it's all holy now. Lord, I've been with you all week, bro. I've been with you all week, bro. You've been blessing me, Lord, but I ain't even talked to you, but you've been blessing me, though. I've been receiving all types of you. I ain't even spoke to you. I ain't open my word. I ain't prayed for nobody. Same mouth I'm cursing people out with is the same one I'm asking for your favor. But I try to hide on Sunday under my worship. No. God sees you. He sees you. And can I just say this? What you do in public is more important. Excuse me. What you do in private is more important than what you do in public. And he's judging most of you on the way that you praise him in your closet more than you do here on a Sunday. Got this chair up here. Ah, man. Been a long day. Should I take my shoes off? I don't, what kind of socks I got on here? I, I'm not going to do that right now. I don't know what kind of socks I got underneath these shoes. Oh, my goodness. Where's the remote at? Let me turn that on. Oh! The commanders are playing? I shouldn't be watching this, but I'm going to watch it anyways. There's nothing, I can't really expect much out of them. But the game's on. I got to watch it. My chip's open. Oh, this is so good. Y'all know I'm weak with this right here. Y'all know this right here. Y'all know it's my weakness. Oh, I got to get the soda, man. Oh, my goodness. This is just. Oh, by the way, don't do, uh, don't do sour cream and onion with, uh, with Coke. It's not a good combination. Oh my goodness, I got my soda. Oh, I got some got crackers over here. I'm gonna go ahead and get these out as well. I'm just going well, I'm trying to get comfortable, y'all. Can y'all leave me? Can I get comfortable, please? Let me relax. Get my chips out, man. Oh man. Put those right here. Oh, I got Oreos too? Oh my. 
Oh, oh, cupcakes. Oh, my, oh, I done spilled my chips, y'all. But, you know, I'm comfortable, though. I'm not going to get up and clean. I'm comfortable. I got my goldfish right here. I got my cup. Oh, my guys, I'm living it up right now. Let's go ahead. Oh, popcorn. This is my snack right here, y'all. This is where it gets started when I get the popcorn out. Don't judge me, y'all. I'm comfortable, man. I'm just being comfortable. Y'all don't mind me. I'm not bothering anybody. I'm just comfortable in my own house. I'm not causing nobody any issues. God's been blessing me. He gave me this chair to sit in. Come on, he gave me this table to put my feet up on. I'm comf- I got this popcorn because of him. Amen. I'm just relaxing. Right, baby, can you help me? The game's on, baby. I'm trying to watch the game. You see, I'm busy right now. I want to watch the game. I want to enjoy this. I'm comfortable right now. Daddy, can you, can you teach me how to ride my bike? Sweetie, I'll I do that tomorrow. I'm comfortable right now. Hey, Dad, can you show me how to shoot a basketball? Son, we're going to do that next week, I promise you. Can we go camping? We will next year. All right, we'll do that. We'll go camping next year. By the time I finish these snacks. Maybe I want to work on our marriage. I do too, but I, I just want to enjoy the game right now because I'm comfortable. Maybe I feel like I want a divorce. What? Really? what I do? I ain't seen you in forever. You've been comfortable. You've been comfortable. You know what the sad thing about this position that I'm in right now? It's not that you're doing this physically, but this reflects your spiritual health. Some of you sitting in here right now, this position reflects your spiritual health. You've gotten comfortable with God based on all that, because you worked hard all day. Remember, you worked hard. You put the work in for eight hours. It wasn't like you didn't go to work. You just wanted to relax. But see, what I had to realize when I became a man and I put away childish things, when I come home, the real work begins. I'm going to go talk to my wife and see her about her day. I'm going to aid her. I'm not going to go back and forth with you. I'm going to come and support you and hear about what happened that you did because you've called me to be the head of my household, Lord. So I'm going to come and check on her status. When my kids are playing, I'm going to get on the floor and find out how their day was and play with them and hear from them and invest in them. Because this is the position so many of us are occupying. We are missing the blessings. And the last time I checked, a ship that's sitting on the coast with an anchor in it is safe. But that's not what it was designed to do. It was meant to be in the ocean sailing. And so many of you are supposed to be sailing in your purpose, in your calling but you've missed it because you've been so comfortable. And you thought just because you came to church that you did God a favor. God's like, that's not what I wanted for. It wasn't just about inside of the walls. It was supposed to actually happen outside of the walls. But because you thought you could just come in here and play church, you thought you could just come in here and act, and I was gonna bless you. You're gonna miss out. And so many of you have empty hearts right now because you don't have a relationship with the one who created your heart. I don't know if this, this, these bags of chips represent your job that you're comfortable with. I don't know if it represents your engagement within your community. Maybe it's the way that you treat your kids. Maybe it's the way that you treat your relationships. Because some of you are looking for a husband from heaven, but you're over here dating from a worldly standard. Some of you are looking for a wife from heaven, but you're dating with a worldly standard. And God's standard is not a worldly standard. Amen. And you've forgotten but probably the main principle when it comes to dating is honoring the person. Amen. So even if this doesn't work out, I'm going to go ahead and say thank you for this opportunity. I respect you and I wish you well. Amen. Instead of cutting somebody off on Facebook or Instagram or sending them a shout out in a disrespectful way, you've forgotten because you got comfortable. Uh-huh. And it felt good because it was satisfying to you. And I'm going to tell you right now, a lot of you are in this position, but you can't even tell you're there. Because comfort blinds you, and you can't see. You can't see. So I'm just going to be comfortable here for the rest of the sermon. If y'all don't mind, I'm just going to stay here and be comfortable. You know, I I just want to realize, I just want to be, y'all can't judge me. I'm just being comfortable, y'all. I mean, what what you want? I just want to be, ugh. That wasn't supposed to happen. (laughs) Everything else was. That wasn't supposed to happen. That's what happens when you got a size 13 shoe, y'all. I'm sorry. That's what happens when you get comfortable. 
That's a word. Let me step off. That was good. We can end service. You make mistakes when you're comfortable. You don't see people who are blessed when you're comfortable. You don't invest in the next relationships because you're comfortable. You don't see the value in the next, re- the, the next generation because you're comfortable. Back in my day, we didn't do that. Man, these kids are lost. That's because you ain't invested. When's the last time you sought after a kid in your community instead of just sitting up there cursing them out from a distance? Or calling them all sorts of names. Why don't you go seek them out? Why don't you go hear his story? Yeah, I know the things that they do are different than you, but have you gone to go figure out how to make them work? The last time I checked, I'm a father to my kids today. That means I'm raising a child in today's world. I have a big responsibility. And I have a big impact on that because I'm engaged. Why won't you engage? And so you're expecting God to engage you, but you treat him like you're comfortable. And look at the mess we made when we're comfortable. Look at the things that we avoided when we're comfortable. My marriage is in shambles because I was comfortable. God's calling you out to the deep. Like, bro, I need you to come out here and start swimming in deep water. You can stay over there as you want, long as you want, but you're not going to receive the blessing until you come out here in the deep water. Amen. That's why I try to spend my, my weeks and my time in conversation with people as opposed to just covering myself up with a fallacy. Amen. I got to go out and do the work. David sent most of the people in his temple outside of the temple because it's not that you would be called, but you would be sent Amen. into the world. So sometimes you think when you come here, you've done your duty. No, your job actually begins when you leave here. So when you're at your job, when you're in those places that you don't particularly care for, you can be the light that provides someone with a spark to make a decision to live for what you're living for. But when you set no examples because you got too comfortable, and some of y'all who are too holy don't even want to share the word of God because you're just making all types of judgments about people. So you know every Bible verse there is out there, but you ain't shared it with nobody. You see that young person, you ain't offered to give them any type of insight because you don't think they're worthy of it. Well, why did God choose you? All right now. Why did God choose you? Why did he choose you? Before I close. I want to give you three points that make the case for comfort. The first one is this. It's comfortable. How about that? Let's just, be, let's just be practical in church. The reason why you choose comfort is because of what? It's comfortable. It's comfortable. Let's, get, let's, let's, just, let's identify that. It's comfortable. It don't require much effort. It don't require much effort. If something's comfortable, I don't have to really do much. And guess what? The driving force behind comfort is 10 times stronger than being uncomfortable. You know what it's like when that couch is sitting there or that opportunity to be stationary is available in comparison to having to get up and do a hundred different things. But what I've come to realize is I was called to work for my family. I was called to be in a position where I'm active for my family. So I should have a mindset that says as soon as I'm around my family or anyone for that matter, I should be fully present fully engaged and ready to go for the calling that God has placed in my life for that particular person or moment. Amen. But so many of us are taking pit stops in the midst of something that should be a complete marathon. I should be running with all that I have. I should be spent at the end of the day completely tired. The Bible says you should work by the spread of your brow. That means you got to put work in sometimes. Right. And it's not to work to receive glory, but it's to show that you're thankful for the life that you have. Amen. So I'm going to go and give every single thing that I have for that 24 hours, for that 24 hours. So that's the first case for comfort. In case anybody's going to walk out of here and be like, yo, I'm still going with the comfort side. I'm going to give you all some facts. I'm not going to just give you one side. I'm going to give you both. The second piece about comfort. It's not unsuspecting, y'all. It's not unsuspecting. So I can prepare for it because I've been through it. It's so much better to be in a room full of familiar people. Some of us are like captivated by a crowd because we know everybody in there. So we feel comfortable because we know everybody. Now, let me say this to you. You know why God went after the one? I love all y'all. Y'all are all great. But I got to go to someone who doesn't know him. So tomorrow, I don't take a day off. I go to find someone who doesn't know him. I go to a house with somebody who has no relationship with him. I go sit with a family who has no understanding on what it means to have an honoring of the Lord. Like, I want to go in those places, 
Not because I want to sit and hit them with the Bible, but I want to sit around them, learn their ways, and then offer them something different if they're willing to listen. But I got to demonstrate what that looks like. But because I was so used to an outcome, because it was unsuspecting, I had to put no work in, because all of us are sometimes afraid of what we don't know. But God says, I want you to go with my, with my presence in your heart into any dark place and you'll be a light. Amen. But so many of you are comfortable being around other light. What difference is that going to make in the world? Exactly. That's why it says you don't get no credit for loving somebody who loves you. Yeah, that's cool, but go love somebody who don't love you. That's hard. Amen. I had to make a call this week to somebody I didn't want to make a call to, y'all. Swallowed my pride. Mm. <laughs> and that's one of my biggest issues because I'm so competitive, and I realize that that competitive spirit might be healthy in one place, but unhealthy in my spiritual life. Amen. I need to partner with people. So I had to call somebody who I know didn't want to hear from me, and I didn't want to hear from them. I said, you know what? This isn't about me. It's about the Lord. Amen. I love you. Amen. I love you. You mean something to me. Amen. You matter to me. And it's not about me. It's about Jesus being the glory and the praise. Amen. So I'm calling you to tell you right now that I love you. And you don't have to talk to me now, but I want to let you know that I love you. And if there's anything we can do, we can fix it at any point in time, but you need to know that I love you because this breath that I have is not guaranteed. Amen. And the Bible says to be at peace with all men if it's within your power. Amen. So that, that there's no excuse for you not making a decision to do your part. They don't have to do theirs, but you do your part. Amen. The Amen. Bible says that they will know us by the way that we love. Yes. If you ain't love nobody, then you're not a part of this. You got to understand the way that you love is the way that God determines if you're going to be a believer, but you can't be comfortable. Amen. The third piece is this. Comfort is satisfying. I, man, I got something out of that. It's a nice soda. I had some chips. The game was on. It was satisfying for me. It felt good to be in that place. Sin is satisfying as well. Come on, let's be honest. Sin is satisfying as well for a temporary moment. That's the way that the devil traps you. Kool-Aid, man. Kool-Aid. This is my reference to the young people. Man, I used to run in the house when I was a kid for that. Mom, you got that Kool-Aid? You see red from a what, like miles away. Water and everything else around. Give me the red. Pour it in big old buckets. Me and my friends just punishing Kool-Aid. Mom's like, hey, don't drink too much of that, baby. You should drink water. Nah, mom, you don't know what you're talking about. This Kool-Aid is amazing. It's not healthy for you. The water actually provided me with what I needed. I actually was more thirsty after drinking the Kool-Aid. Mm. More thirsty after drinking the Kool-Aid. And some of y'all are drinking things you shouldn't be drinking, and you're more thirsty. Desperation is a dangerous place to be when it's not for God. Because you sell and you're, and you're allowed things that don't have the authority to be in your life to be in your life. That's why I talk about relationships with young people so much, because you are allowing people who shouldn't be in your life to be there because you settled for a standard that's not the kingdom's. And when you lower your standards because of desperation, you accept any and everything. Amen. And so I got young people coming to me. I'm just trying it out. I'm just experimenting with it. Mama. The first thing that needs to happen is you need to be educated on it. But if you don't take the time to educate, they're just going to experiment. Mama. Now I want to make the case for the gospel, and I'm going to close. The first one is, because it's the standard by which every single human life can live abundantly. Amen. Every single human life on earth, no matter where you come from. I've been to over 23 countries in my life. And every time I've gone to one of those countries, I have seen the beauty in God's creation. Amen. I don't care what their traditional practices are. I see the same intrinsic qualities in every single human being because you are manufactured by one God. Amen. You have one purpose underneath one God. That's why he talks about the body so much. I'm like, God, what do you mean the body? The physical body? No, you and I are the body. Hallelujah. So although you might be a pinky toe, you are important to the body. Amen. And if you take that pinky toe off, try walking, it's going to be painful. Not right now. You're not going to have any balance. You don't think about it, but it's there and it has significant value. So when I go to another country or to another culture, I respect that individual because they are designed by God, no matter what they may tell me. Amen. Point number two, the gospel is built on promise. Comfort is built on temporary states of pleasure that's posing as destiny. 
That is not where I want to be for the rest of my life. But I could be. I could make that choice. And some of us have made that choice in our own spiritual life to be there forever because it feels good. But God's saying, I need you to hit in a new gear and go to a new place because I have new things that I want to do for you. Amen. The last one, and we'll close as the musicians are making their way up here within my mess. Sorry, guys. The gospel is an open invitation into God's destiny for your life. Let me talk about that. There's three, there's three parts to God's plan. The first one is deliverance. He wants to deliver you from where you are, all right? He wants to take you from where you are. And the destiny is where you need to be. That's where he wants you to be. That's where he wants you to wind up. That's the, that's the destiny piece. So the first part is deliverance. The second one is development. And development is important. Y'all ain't got to clean it up. I do that, guys. I'm sorry, man. I, I owe y'all that. Development. You know what the development piece is? That's what you're living right now in your day-to-day -day life. All of the ups and downs and the challenges in life. That's the development piece. But so many of you want to skip the development to take on something that's a counterfeit. And when you do that, you miss the opportunity for God's plan to be fulfilled. So development is important. And the last one is your destiny. God wants you to be somewhere, but in order to be somewhere, you've got to follow the equation. Amen. You've got to follow the equation. So listen, we're going to go into what I believe is killing Christianity for a couple of weeks and it's comfort. As you stand on your feet today, we're going to stand on our feet really quickly. I want to share with you guys a story. A couple of weeks ago, and I might get a little teary-eyed, but I'm okay. I'm a free man in Jesus. Amen. It might take me a couple of moments to get over my words, but a couple of weeks ago, my family, my wife's family, experienced a tremendous loss. It's a young woman who was 28 years old. And I was at the apartment a couple of weeks ago. I had to clean it with the family. And I knew my biggest challenge was going to be looking into the father's eyes because I, I know him. One, because I know who he was and the way that he devoted his life for his daughters. And she was his first. But two, because I'm a father. And anybody in here who's a parent knows that you never want to put your child to rest. And so as I walked in her apartment and I got the inspiration for this series, I looked through her things and I saw all of these goals, all of these plans that she had for her life, beautiful plans. And the crazy thing about it is she had just fulfilled one of her lifelong goals, which was to graduate college four days before her, after her death. She had just graduated college. She was gone. And as I was looking through her things and I saw all of her plans and all of her visions for what she wanted for her life, God instantly told me in that situation, he said, Andre, don't you ever take your breath for granted. Every single day of your life needs to be a life of uncomfort yes. for me. Because you never know when's the last time you're going to be around the people that you love. You never know the last time you're going to be able to chase after someone for the love of Christ. You never know the time is going to call you home to assess the way that you lived your life. But I guarantee you, if you're wrapped up in comfort, you will miss out on your destiny and all of the beautiful things that he has for your life because you're too locked up in a situation that has you gripped. And so today, 
My ploy is to every single person in here who is under the sound of my voice, who does not have a relationship with Jesus, to not wait another moment for it to happen. Sometimes you've gotten comfortable with skipping this opportunity in church. It'll happen next week. But my wife's cousin didn't have another week. It ended there. And if anybody were to ask us, hey man, I don't think somebody that young would lose their life. But that's not up to us, it's up to him. You don't know when your time is coming, but you do have an opportunity to make a choice to live a life stretched out for Jesus, free for Jesus. I'm gonna ask our prayer partners to come up this morning and to be in position to pray over you. Maybe you're someone who needs prayer about getting out of comfort zones because ultimately that's what Jesus is calling you to do, to get out of comfort zones, to leave the shore where it's safe and to go out to where it's desolate, to where it's chaotic. Because here's the definition of peace. It's not sitting on a seaside beach with no noise or no one to bother you, but the definition of peace is when there's a storm all around you and you are just as confident and as comfortable in the presence of God because he is the only source of comfort. So I'm hoping that someone will make a decision. You can bow your heads, close your eyes. No one's looking around. You shouldn't even be worried about embarrassment or whether or not somebody sees you. Matter of fact, you walking down the aisle might be the thing that somebody else needed to be encouraged to make the walk. But this is a moment where God's he's tugging on your heart and you feel it. I don't even have to say it. It's already happening. You feel it in your heart right now to make a decision. Because ultimately, I don't want you to leave this place the way that you entered. Culture doesn't change unless you set the culture. You set the culture by giving your life to the one who created you to be alive in culture, to lead culture. So we're going to pray. And I'm going to ask for all of you to lift your hands up if you feel comfortable this morning. <laughs> Father, we love you and we honor you. Lord, we thank you for giving us what we don't deserve, for providing us with life that we don't even deserve, giving us a second chance that we don't deserve. Lord, I pray, I trust and believe that this morning you are breaking comfort zones, that you are coming into the hearts of your children today for a change that will last a lifetime. Lord, we honor you. We give you all of us. And we all said, amen. amen. Come on, can we make some noise for Jesus? The Bible says that when one gives their life, the angels in heaven are rejoicing. Amen. Come on, can we make some noise for that, to know that? Amen. Let's worship, guys. Let's worship.